Welcome to the Research and Innovation Showcase. We are pleased to welcome the 16th president of The Ohio State University, Dr. Christina Johnson. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here for today's Research and Innovation Showcase. You may not be surprised to know, but uh, you all have a very special place in my heart um, because I know that you're dedicated and dedicating your lives to creating new knowledge for the greater good. And our community, our research community has been through so much over the past year. The sudden lockdown last, last spring that put this institution's creative minds really to the test, but you kept going. And many of you adjusted your programs in response to the coronavirus pandemic that turned our world and our worlds upside down. I know that Ohio State has long fostered cross-disciplinary research and exploration, even going back to my involvement with the early discovery themes as a reviewer. So I know when you found yourselves facing a global pandemic, existing teams reconvened and new collaborations were born out of necessity and the community got to work. Early on, I'm told that medical and veterinarian medical scientists developed a recipe to fill a gap in the, in the availability of viral transport medium needed to process COVID tests. And environmental health science specialists were part of a statewide disease surveillance effort monitoring wastewater for early signals that the virus was spreading in our communities. Some of this year's Innovator of the Year finalists also answer the call with development of SARS COVID 2 vaccine candidates and at-home COVID-19 diagnostics. And we all know that the scientific expertise from disciplines across the university has guided every step of the university's COVID-19 response. I thank you for your hard work and your amazing resilience, and I am proud to be your colleague. For, for any of our researchers who have worked to patent their discoveries or commercialize their technologies and products through licensing with a private company or form their own companies, I commend you and I wish you luck as this process moves along. I can tell you it's worth it and stick with it because I've been there. I've had the, um, uh, I was gonna say pleasure. Sometimes it was a pleasure, sometimes it was a challenge, but co-founded several companies based on the research that I conducted in university laboratories. And uh, I can tell you firsthand that the road from invention to commercialization can be long and circuitous, but it's definitely worth it. You know, moving discoveries into the marketplace from the lab is one of my proudest accomplishments as an academic. And there's nothing quite like knowing that years of work in the lab have helped an industry advance or made our food supply safer or improved diagnostic testing or saved lives. Good luck to all our finalists today and in your future endeavors. Uh, we've taken steps to create more opportunities for making an even bigger impact through Ohio State University research, creative expression, and innovation. In my very first State of the University address, I emphasized the need to fiercely commit to four kinds of excellence, including excellence in research and creative expression. I estimate that we will invest about 750 million in this decade in our researchers and research. I've also announced plans for the strategic hiring of a minimum of 350 net new tenure track faculty, innovators, creators, and researchers. Among these hires will be scholars in high demand fields, researchers develop new approaches to building an anti-racist society, and faculty in emerging fields of cutting edge research. And we'll provide significant startup support to launch their laboratories and their careers. This growth in faculty will help us reach the goal of doubling our research expenditures in this decade. Structural changes will also help us get there. We've aligned a number of new offices and programs, including the Office of Research, Corporate Engagement, and Technology Commercialization Offices, the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship, and our new Innovation District. The rationale for bringing these all together, uh, various parts of the university, into an innovation ecosystem into this one portfolio is to, ex to expand our research enterprise and to speed the application of research breakthroughs to the to the marketplace where they can improve lives. As you know, this undertaking is being led by Dr. Grace Wong, who joined the university on December 1 of 2020 as our new executive vice president for research, innovation, and the knowledge enterprise. Dr. Wong has decades of expertise in leading research initiatives, attracting grant funding, cultivating stakeholder relationships, and empowering researchers and entrepreneurs. I'm thrilled she's now part of the Buckeye family. 
And I'm thankful to all the researchers and innovators who are asking the right questions, promoting new ideas, and creating solutions to society's greatest challenges. You represent one of Ohio State's many strengths. And now I'll turn the program over to Dr. Wong, uh, who will continue. Thank you and best wishes. Thank you, President Johnson. Welcome to our annual research and innovation showcase. Let me first echo President Johnson to say thank you to our faculty, staff, and students for the amazing research, creative expression, and scholarly work you have been doing. The pandemic has made it challenging for our regular activities in labs, studios, libraries, clinics, fields, and animal research facilities. And yet, you have continued to deliver tremendous results. We thank you for your resiliency and perseverance. And for all the research support professionals, I want to thank each and every one of you for all your efforts and dedication under the stress of the pandemic, teleworking, budget constraints, and also the workday transition. Please know how much we appreciate you and your hard work every day. I would also like to take today's opportunity to thank the team who has worked very hard to put today's event together. And they are Melissa Kubaki, Lori Neer, Tracy Preston, Krista Richardson, and also Don Lazalier. Thank you so much for your efforts. So I will share with you a few thoughts today. The first thought, we must continue to expand curiosity-driven research and creative expression activities. Just give you a quick story. About 10 years ago, I was working at the National Science Foundation. And at the time, NSF launched a program to support research in origami engineering. And at that time, origami engineering was a very nascent field. So I remembered that we talk about the possibility of having a foldable tiny robot to be directed into a human body, have it open up, deliver the drugs or treat the disease, and then be directed out of the human body. And you can see that would mean much more targeted treatment and much less invasive for the patient. But I have to say, at the time, it felt very much like a science fiction. And now, about 10 years later, Professor Renee Chow at Ohio State, in collaboration with researchers at Georgia Tech, has found a way to make soft origami robot using magnetic polymer materials. While we are still very far away from using it to treat a disease, it's no longer a science fiction. So that is the power of curiosity-driven research. We want to support our researchers to fully unleash our creativity and imagination as a research community. And we know that if we are very early with a research concept, it is hard to secure external funding. That is the, uh, the reality. And so that's why we have launched the President's Research Excellence Program, or PRE. And this program will support you to do some preliminary research based on your ideas or form a team to plan for a center grant so that you can be more prepared and hopefully ultimately successful in getting external funding. And we are currently accepting applications. I know that we understand growing research capacity is a long-term effort. So we have committed funding for the PRE program for the next 10 years. Second thought, the societal challenges we are facing today call for large-scale, long-term, highly interdisciplinary research centers or institutes. COVID-19 has posed the most profound shock to the national research enterprise since World War II. It amplifies the critical need for us to research, to innovate, to translate the innovations into products and services, and also to bring them into the marketplace or clinical practice, 
all at an acceler accelerated pace. So if we pause for a minute here and think about this question, if a pandemic can be this disruptive, what would be the impact of food insecurity, climate change, water supply shortage, social inequality, and an aging population? These societal challenges are much longer term and much more complex. And they are way beyond STEM, uh, STEM research. Just think about this. In the recent decades, we have seen tremendous progress in computing, in computation, data analytics, data storage, electronic endpoint devices, and telecommunication. We have also seen tremendous advances in life sciences, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the internet of things, and also quantum information science. And don't get me wrong, this rapidly growing field will continue to drive research break breakthroughs in coming decades. But that's not sufficient. The societal challenges are complex and multifaceted. They involve people, social economics, historical context, culture, arts, and policies. They call for social science breakthroughs. They also call for new ways of thinking and also new approaches in arts and humanities studies. So let me just give you an example here. We as human speakers can master many possible uses of one word without anyone particularly teaching us about it. But that for a computer-based system can be very, very challenging to figure out. And people call this ambigu ambiguous uh, language. So Ohio State professor of linguistic, Michael White and his colleagues have demonstrated the challenges using uh, an online game called Madly Ambiguous. So for computational systems to better overcome the challenges uh, of ambiguous language and also understand the human, they have to gain the uh, cap capability of context reading, which is non-trivial. It's very challenging in terms of research. It calls for continuous research in linguistic, in people, and also in convergent research at the interface of linguistics and artificial intelligence, or what we call natural language processing. So that's just one example about the importance of the arts and humanities research. Again, societal challenges we are facing today call for large scale, highly interdisciplinary research efforts, and they frequently need to be human centered. This is an exciting time for all fields, for life sciences, for physical sciences, for engineering, for social sciences, for arts and humanities because we have the opportunities to explore many uncharted areas at the interfaces of these disciplines. It's all about how creative we can be. So my third thought here, we must expand our innovation ecosystem aggressively. We are at a pivotal time to plan for post-pandemic economic recovery. It calls for technology breakthroughs and also a robust number of startups to fuel the healthy growth of our innovation ecosystem. The university is looking at new ways to support that innovation ecosystem to ensure new knowledge and discovery is being commercialized and put into the marketplace or clinical practice. And in that context, I, will, I am very excited to share with you that our technology commercialization office is now being better structured to support our faculty who are interested in commercializing their research. We are also building on our existing corporate partnerships to identify not only new ways for us to connect with corporate partners, but also identify the new partners to collaborate with which will lead to new opportunities for our faculty, students, and staff. 
President Johnson has also announced a new student startup accelerator called the Buckeye Entrepreneur Awards Program. This will be an annual competition for students to be selected as Buckeye entrepreneurs and also be awarded funds to work on their new ventures for a year. We are excited about the potential of our innovation district. This 270-acre district will enable research advances, technology translation, experiential education opportunities, and also startup opportunities. We will build partnerships, grow talent, and, cr and create a live, play, and innovate environment. This district will unleash Ohio State's potential to transform the region, drive economic growth, and serve our people in new ways. And before I close, I want to say the entire enterprise for research, innovation, and knowledge team is committed to the success of our faculty, students, and staff. And I'm very pleased to share with you that we have created a new unit called the Office of Knowledge Enterprise to focus on research faculty development and proposal support, including large proposal submission. Dr. Dorota Brzezinska serves as the interim vice president for the knowledge enterprise. I'm also thrilled to share with you that Dr. Peter Moeller is now the interim vice president for research, leading our research strategies, operations, and also large scale research centers. And Mr. Scott Osborne is our Vice President for Innovation and Economic Development, continue to lead the growth of corporate partnerships, intellectual property, technology commercialization, entrepreneurship, and also startup activities. Today is a day for celebration. And as I conclude my remarks, I want to congratulate and thank all of our research and a creative inquiry spotlight sp uh, speakers and the finalists for Innovator of the Year, for Early Career Innovator of the Year, and also for Next Generation Innovator of the Year. Congratulations. And a hearty congratulations to the 75 Ohio State researchers who were awarded patents in 2020. Further congratulations to the 40 Ohio State researchers whose technologies were licensed in 2020, and also congratulations to the 23 Ohio State researchers that had startup companies formed based on their technologies during the year of 2020. The future is bright at Ohio State, and it is our opportunity to drive the progress together. And now I would like to turn over the program to Dr. Peter Moeller and Mr. Scott Osborne, who will emcee the rest of today's event. Thank you very much, Peter and Scott. Thank you, Grace. I'm Scott Osborne. And I'm, and I'm Peter Moeller. And thank you all for being here today. This is a, a great day for, for science and innovation. And I think as we've seen over the last year, Scott, you know, science is, and innovation have never been as important in our lifetimes as they are today. And I would also say the impact of Ohio State in that science and innovation really for the state, you know, the, the, the nation and the, and the global community has never really been as relevant. So it's, it's a great day and, and um, we're gonna have a fun next hour. We're happy that you can all join us today to celebrate the impact and people really behind Ohio State's research and innovation ecosystem as Grace said. The words of President Johnson and Dr. Wong are, are, have never been as true as they are today. This truly is a transformational time for Ohio State and the university. And we're really thrilled how invested our leaders in um, are in to improve the, the land grant mission and improve the well being of the state, region, and, and, and global communities. And while our methods for how we accomplish our mission may have changed over the past year, there's one thing that continues to drive us, passion and curiosity. And what better way for you to experience that drive than to hear from some of our researchers themselves. Today, we have three passionate investigators that will share their life's work with us. 
So our first speaker from the College of Public Health will show us how the university and community organizations can really partner together to find discoveries that help people and, and show how we can amplify these findings into other communities. So it's my pleasure to welcome Juliana Nimeth. Though in my mid forties, I'm only in my fourth year of a faculty position. I'm a community-based advocate turned intervention scientist, having spent over a decade working alongside survivors of sexual and domestic violence, who experience health disparities and often struggle with a wide range of seemingly unconnected health conditions. What motivated me to return to earn the PhD? A gnawing feeling that health justice for survivors was elusive. We were missing something. I remember one of the last calls I took on the crisis line shortly before returning to school. It was from a survivor who had suffered repeated physical abuse and molestation at the hands of her father, and she struggled to find a mental health counselor who could help. She attended support groups and dropped by the agency unannounced just to talk, always with the sweetest smile on her face. Yet, she was shaky on her feet and I always felt like she was having a difficult time focusing her eyes. She was young, too young to be taking a smoke break. That afternoon, when I took her call, she had been notified that her father was back in the state. She was hysterical. She was drunk. She was alone. She was suicidal. Having been failed so many times before, she felt hopeless and did not believe that any health or service system could help her. So I sat there and talked with her for a long, long time. That day, I vowed to figure out what we were missing. How could we help her? How could we alleviate the suffering of so many violent survivors like her? I'm here today to talk with you about the transformative power of community research partnerships, a necessary relationship to make visible to both community advocates and research scientists what I've discovered neither of us could see on our own. Sexual and domestic violence, two types of interpersonal violence which disproportionately impact women and children, are public health crises, the burden of which is inequitably distributed. The same populations that develop disease and die at higher rates due to structural oppression experience more violence, including those living with disabilities or in the Appalachian region of our state, racial and ethnic minorities, those in the LGBTQ community, or those trafficked for labor or sex. So when I share with you that one in three women in her lifetime will experience sexual or domestic violence, that rate is much higher for some. My first funded research project occurred through happenstance. The Ohio Domestic Violence Network received a federal grant to build a program to help advocacy organizations better meet the needs of domestic violence survivors with mental health and brain injury challenges. They brought me in as an evaluator initially, but after I heard what they wanted to do, I made a suggestion. I would take the project through Human Subjects Research Review in order to be able to more generally disseminate our findings. Despite initial skepticism, their trust in me and OSU as a research institution has led to discoveries that neither of us could have achieved on our own. Our first step as partners was to conduct a needs assessment. We held focus groups with staff at domestic violence service organizations to ask them what they knew about and what they would need in order to support survivors. Then we interviewed survivors about their needs. I remember the day that our community research partnership changed both community advocacy and brain injury research and rehabilitation forever. The ODVN team and I were sitting in their conference room reviewing summary statistics from the survivor interviews, and I remember feeling completely overwhelmed by what we found, embarrassed even, having worked directly with struggling survivors for over a decade. I'm going to show you the data. It will probably shock you too. We asked survivors, how many times in your life have you ever been hit in your head or were made to have your head hit another object? 
Only three out of 20 people had never been hit in the head. That means 17 in 20 had. And half of those had been hit so many times they couldn't remember. Blunt force head trauma followed by altered consciousness results in traumatic brain injury. It's the same story when we look at choking and strangulation. 17 out of 20 survivors seeking services have been strangled. Oxygen deprivation from strangulation results in a hypoxic anoxic injury to the brain. We went on to discover that survivors often experience both kinds of assault concurrently and repeatedly within the larger context of toxic stress and coercive control. Brain injuries, though each unique, cause cognitive, emotional, and physical problems, and even if identified or treated, can lead to comorbid issues like substance use and suicide. While chronic brain injuries are pervasive among domestic violence survivors seeking services, advocates were missing them. And all of our service systems, safety, criminal and civil justice, health, social service, have been set up assuming survivors have intact neurologic function. How can we expect a survivor to find safety, justice, or healing if they have an unrecognized brain injury? This community research partner discovery led to the creation of CARE, a health justice advocacy intervention to assist domestic violence program staff in addressing the health needs of survivors. CARE works for a wide range of health issues by taking brain injury into account. Because of CARE, I started asking questions in my research with homeless youth who also experience intersecting structural oppression. Among these youth as well, brain injury from interpersonal violence is highly prevalent and is associated with mechanisms known to impact behavioral change success. By bringing the tools of scientific investigation to community sites who serve populations burdened by the intersections of injustice, interpersonal violence, and disparity, we've brought hope visible on the faces of survivors when they realize that they have an invisible injury, one which can be mended to alleviate pain and despair. We've discovered the missing piece, brain injury which was invisible to the community advocate alone is now visible through scientific inquiry. However, the story doesn't end there. I dare say that our community-based discoveries have also made visible missing pieces within brain injury research and within clinical brain injury response. In light of this, OSU's chronic brain injury program has embraced our discoveries and is positioned to be a world leader in scientific discovery regarding brain injury sustained through interpersonal violence. A missing piece is now visible to all of us in community-based clinical and research settings through the transformational power of a symbiotic community research partnership. We need the community as much as the community needs us. And when we work together respecting the insights the other brings, all of our worlds are transformed. In my case, I'm convinced we've discovered a mechanism fueling health disparities among our most vulnerable populations. And our community research partnership will be the foundation upon which a more equitable future is built. As leaders at a land-grant research institution, isn't this the highest ideal we can aspire to? As those engaged in creative inquiry, I encourage you to build transformational, mutually beneficial partnerships, mm -hmm. ones that will bring together community and research to make visible that which neither can see on our own. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. So impactful and so inspiring. Our next speaker from the College of Arts and Sciences studies how we can better understand the human condition by examining how we interact with music and how music has evolved over time. Please join me in welcoming Dan Shanahan. There are a lot of things with music that we often don't take the time to think about. How is it that this song
is the same as this song. Why do some things in a song change and others don't? My name is Daniel Shanahan and I run the Music Cognition Lab at Ohio State. We study everything from how music moves us, to how we move to music, to what it means for us to change parts of a song as we pass it along, like my kids do when they change a word in a game of telephone. Music is a cultural artifact unlike any other. All around the world it's used for pleasure, for mourning, to evoke nostalgia, to be a part of ritual, for social bonding, for medicinal purposes, and in many other functions. But what can music tell us about ourselves? In our lab, we believe that by studying the cultural artifact that is music, including how it changes, how we produce it, and how we move to it, we can better understand the human condition. One of the ways we can learn all about this is through studies of transmission. Most of us probably experienced transmission as a game of telephone in elementary school. And in 1932, Frederick Bartlett designed an experiment in which people were presented with an image and were asked to draw what they saw. And what they drew was then presented to the next person. He was interested in what features would be lost in transmission and what would remain. What changes and what stays the same can tell us a lot about what people think should be there and how they fill in the gaps. Let me tell you another cool example of transmission. In this study by Michael Kalish and his colleagues, people were presented with these shapes or random points on a graph. And over the course of transmission, all of these shapes would coalesce into the same type of line. And this same thing happens in music. Researchers have found that people presented with random taps with no consistent rhythm whatsoever will eventually turn it into something that conforms to the typical rhythms that we hear every day. And this effect seems to be cross-cultural. And we can study the effects of culture through such change. A 2020 study of yodeling found that pitches being performed in the early 20th century, which might to our ears sound out of tune, began to fit more within the tunings that most of us are accustomed to these days over time. This suggests that the advents of both recording technology and mass media have created a sort of flattening in how folk music is being performed. So why do melodies change like this? And what might that tell us about the human experience? My research has found that a lot of these changes are influenced by physical constraints, suggesting that many of the factors that lead to change in language might also be present in music. My colleague Joshua Albrecht and I asked participants to play this game of musical telephone, and we found that certain melodies were more likely to be changed than others. In particular, melodies that ended with an ascending melodic line, such as this one, la, 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 la. were more likely to transform into endings that would descend than vice versa, such as this one. La, 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 la. In linguistics, scholars often discuss declination in phrases, in which phrases tend to decline over the course of an utterance due to the decrease in oxygen. And the added effort means that pitch often goes down by the end of a phrase. And it's likely the same in music. By studying these effects in music, we might be able to inform our understanding of how this happens in language. Thinking this might have something to do with why certain melodies are changing and others aren't, Josh and I decided to look at what songs actually do. We analyzed about 9,000 Dutch folk songs, half of which were vocal songs, whereas another half were performed on instruments. And we found that vocal music does seem to have more descending notes over the course of a phrase than instrumental music does. This is all to say that when sung melodies change, it's often because it's easier to perform the melody in a different way. By understanding this phenomenon, we can understand more about how our bodies inform how we express ourselves through song. We can also look at musical transmission as a way to look at how humans make decisions. In a follow-up study with some colleagues at Louisiana State University, we adopted a model in which each person heard melodies not sung by a single person, but from multiple people. We found that participants were more likely to replicate the example that stuck out. That is, if they were presented with three melodies that went down at the end and one that went up, they would often sing the one that went up. 
Interestingly, this seems to be contradictory with the previous findings. We would expect people to sing what's easier just because it's easier. But the story here implies there is an element of decision at play. A novel melody might be more likely to be remembered and repeated than one that blends in. A question such as, why do melodies change, is a deceptively complex question. That's why we approach it from so many angles, field work, lab work, computational studies, and in-depth musical analysis. When we gain a better understanding of how we engage with music, we can uncover so much about how we perceive the world around us, how we make decisions, and how our bodies are tied up in all of it. In other words, we learn more about the world around us and the full complexity of what it means to be human. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, incredible work from you and your team. Our final um, spotlight spe speaker for today from the College of Medicine has worked with the team to help make more organs viable for transplantation through a concept that, that aviator Charles Lindbergh had in, in, in a hand in developing. Really cool, cool history. Please welcome uh, me in joining um, Sylvester Black to the stage. I've always had a fascination with medicine and particularly surgery. When I was younger, about seven or eight years old, my mother would take me to the medical library where she was doing her research for her master's degree. I would sit amongst the stacks of medical textbooks, and while I didn't always understand the science, I was drawn to the surgical history and the great things many of these pioneers did. Rerouting digestive tracts and the blood supply to fix all manner of medical ailments, it was fascinating. I was not your typical seven-year-old. The surgeon's mentality can often be described as Occam's razor. Entities should not be multiplied without necessity. Or simply put, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. The beautiful simplicity of fixing these ailments with your hands and your mind was particularly inspirational to me. Even as a kid, I could see that in medicine, anything was possible, that the present day is really the science fiction of someone's past. Some of the things that these pioneers could only dream about back then are now routine in the field of transplantation. We can take organs from a person who is deceased or living and put them into another person who is dying of end-stage organ failure, bringing them back to a full state of health and well-being. That's remarkable. The earliest beginnings of transplantation were marked with frustration. In 1914, Alexis Carell pioneered the method to connect blood vessels together, or what we call vascular anastomoses. He won the Nobel Prize for his work, which showed its full implementation in organ transplants performed in animals. He demonstrated that the organ transplantation was technically feasible. You can take an organ from an individual and put it into another and have good physiologic function was impressive in its own right. However, Carell's efforts were burdened by a biological barrier, which quickly destroyed the transplanted organ. And we now understand that that problem was rejection, facilitated by the immune system. Transplantation was first attempted in humans in the 1930s, but with only six hour survival. In the 1960s, transplantation began in earnest. The results were dismal. We didn't have a complete understanding of how the immune system worked and had very rudimentary drugs to prevent rejection. The 1980s and 90s brought about the modern era of transplantation. An increased understanding of the immune system led to better medications to control rejection. There were significant improvements in anesthesia and in the intensive care unit. There was also refinement in surgical technique, all of which has led to an increased survival for our patients. We are now able to do transplants with relatively low mortality and excellent survival rates, oftentimes greater than 90%. In some ways, we are now victims of our own success. The problem is that we don't have enough organs to meet the demand. There are many people that die every day on the waiting list because organs aren't available for transplantation. The crux of the problem lies in the quality of the donor organ. You see, people have to die in a particular way for their organs to be usable for transplantation and only a tiny percentage of donor deaths are able to actually yield a usable donor organ. In some estimates, that's less than 1% of all deaths. The donation and recovery process can also be incredibly damaging to donor organs, rendering them unable to be transplanted. Another significant problem is the general age and associated diseases in the donor population. It makes some donor organs risky to transplant because the quality of those organs is diminished. Thus, transplant centers and surgeons frequently will not transplant these organs because they pose an unacceptable risk to the recipient. Because there is such a shortage of donor organs, 
Some patients who could benefit from a life-saving transplant are not even listed, further limiting access to transplantation. But what if you could use all the potential donor organs, no matter the age of the donor or the circumstances of their deaths? What if we could take all these organs and repair them so that they could be used in transplantation? We are doing just that. At The Ohio State University, we are participating in clinical trials that use machines to keep organs alive outside of the body in conditions approximating normal physiology and importantly, meet the metabolic demands of the donor organ. Think of these devices as miniature intensive care units. This technology, however, is not new. It was actually conceived in the 1930s by famous aviator Charles Lindbergh and the experimental surgeon Alexis Carell. Using simple methods such as blown glass and mechanical pumps, they kept organs alive outside the body for many hours, even days. This technology was revitalized in the early 2000s. As co-director of the Copper Laboratory, our research utilizes the concept of organ machine perfusion as a platform for what we call arming the organ, which stands for the assessment of function, repair of injury, and the modification to improve donor organ performance. So here we see an organ in one of these machine perfusion devices being supported before transplantation. Here we are taking the organ out of the machine and getting ready to implant it into a patient. And here I am doing the liver transplant operation from a liver that was just a few minutes ago on a machine. Our research centers around four essential tents that we believe will yield more successful organ rehabilitation and repair. First, we seek to stop inflammation and organ injury by inhibiting particular inflammatory pathways. One such pathway is CD38. We've developed several novel therapeutics, including small nanoparticles, which function like heat-seeking missiles with an inhibitor warhead. They block the pathway and silence the inflammation. Second, we repair at the cellular level by utilizing synthesized cell repair proteins such as MG53, like a molecular bandage, we can prevent cellular death and organ dysfunction that may occur during organ procurement and preservation. Third, donor organs need oxygen, and to meet that need, we are using synthesized large diameter polyhemoglobin molecules that function like red blood cells in the organ preservation solution. This has the effect of prolonging organ viability. And fourth, we have utilized several synthetic molecules that improve antioxidant defense and protect donor organs' metabolic function before transplantation, further improving donor organ performance. Taken together, these technologies may usher in an era where no one dies because of the lack of a suitable donor organ. It's beautiful simplicity. If an organ is injured and not transplantable, it can be taken out of the body, hooked up to a machine, and repaired. While the idea of a room full of organs being repaired, similar to what you would see in a machine or an auto repair shop, sounds a bit like science fiction, it is fast becoming today's reality for the benefit of patients around the world. If we want to solve our world's most pressing and complex problems, we must continue to strive in our research and our innovation. We must be audacious and tenacious, knowing that one day our ideas can become reality. It's fascinating to see how so many more lives can be extended through your work, Dr. Black. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Scott, what's so cool is that we have thousands of researchers every day here at Ohio State, people like Juliana, Dan, and Sly engaged in these solutions for complex problems, just, just you know, right, right out the window. It's, it's just been a fun place to work at. Today, um, we celebrate them and the impact they have at campus and beyond. Peter, today we are also here to award the university's Innovators of the Year Awards. These awards annually recognize three researchers, each at different points in their careers, who are actively working to translate university discoveries through commercialization so their work could truly impact lives. All right, and the first one up is the Next Generation Innovator of the Year Award. This award is granted to an undergraduate or graduate student or a postdoc to recognize innovation and entrepreneurship that contributes to the development or commercialization of a new technology. Let's hear from each of our finalists in their own words about their own work. One of the leading operations that we perform as plastic and reconstructive um, surgeons is uh, reconstruction after cancer operations, especially as we're affiliated with uh, the James Cancer Center. 
One of the um, most common operations is reconstruction after patients have undergone mastectomy for breast cancer. Everybody has something called a foreign body reaction to implanted materials. And in up to 20% of patients, this foreign body reaction can actually be pathologic uh, with a diagnosis that we call capsular contracture. It can actually deform the reconstruction over time. It can uh, deform, it causes misplacement of it, and it causes significant pain for the patient. So what we have incidentally discovered is that a medication that is commonly used to treat breast cancer, as an aside, actually results in significantly reduced capsule formation around silicone prostheses. And so what we are working on now is developing the use of this drug uh, in a local delivery platform around breast prostheses in a way that will allow us to mitigate the host response to that biomaterial and hopefully prevent the pathologic state of capsular contracture in patients. The name of my project is C3D, 3D printing for the blind. When I was in sixth grade, I decided to teach myself braille so I could read books in the car without getting dizzy. I then was looking for more excuses to keep learning braille, and I found out that I could add braille labels to 3D printed models so blind students can make their own scientific observations and not have to only rely on a description of someone else's observation. I actually came to OSU mainly because of the Innovation Studio with the financial support and advice they could provide so I could take C3D to the next level. Since 2017, we have distributed over 1,400 models to people in 21 states in the U.S. and nine countries. Our most popular category is human anatomy. We've done lots of models of the brain, the digestive system, the inner ear, it makes me so excited when a blind student tells me that they now want to pursue biology because they touch the DNA model and now they're excited about DNA. We are not just a service that provides models, we provide models and work on connecting the community and finding places where 3D printing could be more accessible as well as just the world could be more accessible for blind people. My innovation is a peer-to-peer -peer support platform for college students to have anonymous, on-demand conversations with peers that share similar experiences. I actually have a family member who um, went out of state for college, and pretty early on he started to develop symptoms of homesickness and anxiety. And one thing that really helped him was that he would reach out to his friends from home, and basically what he was doing was he was trying to find somebody that knew what he was going through so that he could ask questions and know that he was not alone in what he's dealing with. And from there, I started to research the benefits of peer-to-peer -peer support. It's absolutely a community effort. I've gotten a lot of help along the way um, from the professors throughout the entrepreneurship program and the Ohio State Wellness Team. So I hope that this can be implemented on college campuses and serve as that first line of, of defense before it gets to the point of requiring professional services. But ultimately, I believe that this peer-to-peer -peer support can benefit other communities as well. For example, a lot of times people with new disabilities have a hard time connecting with other people that have that same disability. So I think this type of peer-to-peer -peer support can help those type of communities as well. So I think it's very safe to say that our junior investigators at Ohio State are truly poised to make a difference as their careers take off. For our next generation innovator, we actually have a tie today. Congratulations to Jenny Barker in the College of Medicine and Caroline Karbowski from the College of Arts and Sciences, who was actually nominated by the College of Nursing. I would like to thank the Office of Research and the Office of Innovation and Economic Development for this incredible opportunity. I'm proud to represent the Ohio State University College of Medicine for the Next Generation Innovator of the Year Award. As an MD-PhD surgeon scientist training in plastic and reconstructive surgery, my long-term research goals center around the development of technologies as a scientist that will ultimately benefit plastic and reconstructive surgery patients in the operating room. 
A critical element to achieve this goal is to learn the many facets of collaboration with industry. Towards this end, I would like to recognize the support that I have received from the Reach for Commercialization program through the Ohio State Advance Office, and in particular, the efforts of Dr. Mary Juhas and Caroline Crisofoli. I would like to recognize my primary research mentors, Dr. Christopher Brewer and Matthew Porteous, who, as physician scientists highly engaged in translational research, have made it a point to include exposure to technology development in my mentored curriculum. Lastly, I would like to thank my department chair, Dr. Amy Moore, for ongoing support as a surgeon scientist, and the College of Medicine leadership, Drs. Bradford and Moeller, for the nomination for this award. Wow, thank you so much. It is such an honor to win this amazing and distinguished award. I would like to thank the Office of Research and the Office of Innovation and Economic Development, the Ohio State University Innovation Studio, and Entrepreneurial Business Law Clinic for supporting me. I've been blessed to have the encouragement from the sci Access community, local schools, businesses, and organizations, and of course, the C3D model recipients, volunteers, team, and board. What excites me as I look back at the start of C3D in high school are all of the teachers, fellow students, and blind mentors who believed in me. When I came to OSU, it was the people I met at the dining halls and career fairs who helped transition C3D from a side project into a sustainable nonprofit. I would like to thank my roommates, friends, and family for their support, and to my parents. Thank you for your unending guidance. It is my hope that this award will help C3D continue its mission to connect blind and sighted people, augment access to educational materials, and increase awareness for the need to make the 3D printing process accessible for blind people. Thank you again for this honor, and go Bucks! Congratulations, Jenny and Carolyn. Our next two awards recognize researchers who are more established in their careers and are actively working to advance discoveries made at the university along the commercialization pathway by disclosing inventions, patenting, licensing technologies, or forming startups. These activities are important in not only improving lives, but supporting our land grant mission by contributing to the region's economic development. Our finalists for Early Career Innovators of the Year are all focused on fighting disease from all areas of the university, including pharmacy, arts and sciences, and engineering. So let's hear from them now. Uh, it turns out that the underserved population are considered last when it comes to the race uh, of technology. And so, what we are doing now is developing simple tools that are based on, on instruments that can be applied to a diagnose asymptomatic patients. The way that we do it in achieving high performance to cost ratio is using cheap materials. So cheap materials, I mean ordinary paper and even thread, thread that you can pull from your fabric, from your clothing. So here's an example of a paper-based microfluidic that we've invented in our lab to enable us to go to the field, collect samples onto this paper device. Since we know that these communities are poor, with one portable miniaturized instrument, we can serve the whole community. OSU has helped me so much. My colleagues here have been very supportive. The students I get very, 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 very dedicated to the kind of work we do. It's amazing. My long-term goal is to reach millions of people uh, across the world so that everybody can have an excellent, and affordable diagnostic uh, program where diseases can be diagnosed in time and treated um, appropriately. What we're looking at here is in the general field of tissue engineering. So tissue engineering is a, a field that looks at how do we develop um, synthetic means to replace disease or damaged tissue. So coming from a background in robotics and manufacturing, which is my background, 
Uh, we look at this process that, that people are currently investigating right now, where they build tissue engineering constructs in the lab, and then they uh, then have to implant these constructs in an open surgery. And so what we mean by open surgery, these are surgeries large enough that a surgeon can get his or her hands inside the patient to deliver this. And so what we looked at from an additive manufacturing or 3D printing point of view is how can we use existing robotic surgery architectures, like for instance the Da Vinci type system, and modify that system to have a delivery head where we can deliver tissue engineering constructs inside the body of living patients. And so what you see behind me is the first of its kind. Um, this is a prototype machine that is built off of uh, robotic surgery systems and looking at how we can take current robotic surgery instruments and uh, permit the ability to deliver biomaterials into the body through a minimally invasive surgical site. So we want to be adopted by a robotic surgery company to take one of those surgical tools or to become one of the, the surgical tools in the suite of tools they have and deliver new functionality to robotic surgery. That's the main goal here. So my research group is focused on new therapies for bacterial infections caused by antibiotic resistant bacteria. So when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, um, I had to change groups at one point and the, the antibacterial group was filled with people who had discovered cures for MRSA and other life-threatening infections and I just was you know, so inspired by the work that they did and what they had accomplished that that's what I decided to devote my time to as well. You see this tangled up cord here? Within a bacterial cell, bacteria have DNA that also gets tangled and wrapped up like this, and they have specialized enzymes to unwind those tangles. We interfere with the function of those enzymes so that the DNA gets damaged and the bacteria die. And it turns out that all bacteria have those types of enzymes, so with the right molecule, we could target many different types of bacterial infections. If we're successful, the, the lasting impact will be saving patients' lives um, from life-threatening infections. The types of molecules we work on, they could have activity for human patients or also for pets like dogs that have life-threatening infections. Uh, but that, our goal is to you know, save a patient's life at the end of the day. Scott, it's really exciting to see how we can focus on really important problems from so many perspectives at Ohio State. It's really fun to watch. I'd like to congratulate Abraham Badu Tawai as the Early Career Innovator of the Year awardee. What a privilege and honor to be selected as 2021 Early Career Inventor of the Year. I must thank several people uh, that made this achievement possible. First, I want to thank Professor Susan Olesik, Dean of Natural and Mathematical Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, Professor Claudia Turo, Chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Professor Chris Jaroniak, Associate Dean, uh, Research and Creative Inquiry, College of Arts and Sciences, and Professor Jane Jackman, Vice Chair for Research and Administrations, Chemistry and Biochemistry, for believing in our work and nominating me for this award. Second, I wish to express my appreciation to all students, postdoctoral, graduate, undergraduate, and high school students who have contributed to the development of these inventions. It is one thing to conceive of an idea, but it is a completely different thing to enable and make it work. Everyone's efforts, however small, have contributed significantly to where we are today. I also want to thank Dr. Art Gure and Dr. Cordelia Battelle at the Technology Commercialization Office for their continuous effort to seek investors uh, for our inventions. A big thank you also goes to the Selection Committee for recognizing the importance of our inventions, directly or indirectly, this recognition shows the strong commitment Ohio State has towards the underserved groups, which includes ethnic minorities, children, developing countries, and elderly people. Collectively, 
our technologies will, uh, will make early disease and diagnosis in underserved groups both possible and affordable. Finally, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to my wife, kids, and friends for their unwavering support and prayers. Thank you. Congratulations, Abraham. While the past year presented obstacles, it did not stall the work of our researchers. We actually have five finalists for our Innovator of the Year Award, including a nominated team who built upon past research to help fight the COVID pandemic. Let's hear from the innovators in our top category. Uh, infectious disease is the one major cause of death worldwide. Vaccine is the most effective strategy to prevent infectious disease. In the past 13 years, I have been working very closely with Dr. Niewiski to conduct vaccine-related research. Dr. Lee and I have been working for a long time together and we've been developing vaccine candidates. And so my group has been leading a vaccine platform for respiratory syncytial virus, which we have licensed to a company in collaboration with him. And his group has um, invented a measles virus SARS-CoV-2 vaccine platform, which also has been licensed to a company. Our expertise is kind of complementary. So I'm a sort of molecular biologist. Dr. Niewiski is more focused on the viral pathogenesis and the immunity. And now the vaccine um, Dr. Lee and I have developed is actually being used to immunize, hopefully in the future after clinical trials, children so that they would be immune against coronavirus as well as measles. My, my vision is that we can develop a safe and highly effective vaccine with a long lasting immunity that can protect human and animal from virus infection. My entire research is for the flu intranasal delivery system, developing the new platform, vaccine platforms. So mainly for the COVID and flu, since there are respiratory infections, we are planning the vaccine if we deliver through intranasal route. So the protection will be superior compared to getting the injection. If we deliver the vaccine directly to the mucosal sites, like the respiratory tract through intranasal route, it's capable of inducing robust local immunity and also the systemic immunity like how you get by injection. So both are possible if you deliver the, a potent vaccine. If you develop a good vaccine platform, we can induce that kind of immunity which is helpful in providing the uh, broader protection and also robust protection in the local sites so that the infection will be mitigated effectively compared to by injection. I have been so fortunate at every stage at the Technology and Commercialization Office at Ohio State. So far from last 10 years, we have been working on these studies, which gave us promising results. And we have three US patents and two licenses to companies in the animal vaccines, which are delivered by intranasal route. So now this platform can be easily translated for humans applying the similar uh, knowledge. Last year, uh, we had about four discoveries. Uh, number one, we, uh, we invent a method for the treatment of the uh, liver cancer. So I think another one, we have a discovery uh, for the treatment of the lung cancer. Then, and also discover the uh, nanoparticle have a very special property. It's a rubber or like a amoeba. So they can change the shape and structure and it's a motion process and find a uh, find a cancer in tumor and then uh, target to tumor. And then in the body, so they clear from the kidney very quickly in half hour after injection. So because it's a faster cancer targeting and faster kidney uh, excretion, so come out this uh, no toxicity. And the other one is uh, during the COVID pandemic. And after this uh, disease coming, I apply for three grant proposal for COVID virus uh, one is a diagnosis, and one is uh, for the treatment, and another one is a vaccine development. So the diagnosis uh, project was funded by OSU, 
and we finish uh, the diagnosis of very, very faster. Faster and simple method can use in the home uh, with all the diagnosis of the COVID-19 infection. I have been working on an idea of uh, integrating uh, breast cancer treatment and diagnosis with uh, reconstruction. So here I can show you there is a silicone breast implant and we want to cover it with a fiber mat that contains drugs. And it's not cytotoxic, it's very, very friendly in the body. So once you have the reconstruction, this would serve as well as a chemotherapy agent, but it would reduce the side effects considerably. It would be basically wrapped around the whole implant. So this would be what, what the body sees. And as I said, this would contain various drugs. So you can have antibiotics, you can have the cancer drugs, anti-inflammatory agents, so, and they would slowly release into the body. I would like to see it in clinical practice, saving women because, you know, just the shock of having breast cancer, then the removal of your breast and replacement, and then the chemotherapy is, is just a terrible experience. So hopefully, you know, through these avenues, we can get this into clinical practice. Well, it's, it's great to be a Buckeye, a lot of pride, um, amazing talent really from all over the university. So it's exciting to see the innovations to improve the health and well-being of society coming out of Ohio from Ohio State. Um, we'd like to congratulate um, Paige Wang Guo from the College of Pharmacy for this award. Um, Dr. Guo. First of all, I would like to thank Deans Henry Mann and Cynthia Conch of the College of Pharmacy for nominating me for this prestigious Innovation Award. I feel truly honored to be standing here today. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the team at the Office of Research, the Office of Innovation and Economic Development, and the members of the Innovation Award Committee for selecting me for this award. I'd also like to thank everyone responsible for planning and organizing this wonderful event. Additionally, without the diligent work and cohesive effort of my students, postdocs, and many other colleges throughout the years, as well as the support from the OSU and the Cancer Center. None of this would have been possible. For several decades, we expect that ANGE would be the third milestone in pharmaceutical drug development. Now, the time has finally come. I look forward to continuing to work with everybody to welcome the spring of ANGE therapeutics. So, Thank you, everybody, for your support. Congratulations, Page One, and thank you for your work in the fight against cancer. We're so glad you could join us today, all of you from across the university and across the state, especially as we embark on this transformative time for research and innovation all across the university. We're inspired by all the passion and discoveries we've shared today and really look forward to working with all of you in the future and seeing you next year, hopefully in person. Thank you all. Thank you.